Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number five of the Spycraft 101 podcast. Speaking with me today is Captain Neil Hansen, a former pilot with Air America, which flew dangerous, secretive missions throughout Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War era. Neil spent years living in Laos, sometimes flying multiple hops each day, frequently being shot at, but never turning down a single mission, no matter the level of danger. Neil's lived through experiences that most of us can barely even imagine, and I was really grateful for the chance to hear about them from him firsthand. Neil, thank you for joining me today. I've heard and read a lot about you, and it seems like you found yourself in some amazing places and times, flying some dangerous missions with some incredible people throughout your life. So what was it that attracted you to flying in the first place? I was attracted to flying as a preteen up in northern Michigan. And I ended up coming down to Detroit after my mother remarried and hanging out at Detroit City Airport and began to wash airplanes and get enough money to learn how to fly. Back then, you could wash three airplanes an hour at $5 a piece, so that was pretty darn good money. Wow, that was. Uh, <laughs> it fueled my need to uh, learn how to fly. Eventually, I ended up buying an airplane for $1,300 up in Cadillac, Michigan. And that same airplane today is worth now a quarter of a million. Oh, wow. What model was that? <laughs> that was a Cessna 140. Hmm. So how old were you when you actually got into the pilot seat? I was 15 when I started flying. But 16, I soloed and 17, I got my private and I got my commercial license shortly thereafter. And I had my commercial license prior to and flight instructors uh, rating prior to graduating from high school. I didn't even have a driver's license. <laughs> you were flying before you were driving. That's right. Oh, wow. Wow, that's amazing. So what did you do with that license? Who did you start flying for initially? Well, I did a, a brief stint in the Air Force and helicopters when I turned old enough to enlist. And then uh, uh, getting out of the Air Force, I had a flight instructor's rating and an instrument rating, and I was flying charter out in Reno, Nevada. That kind of petered out. So I came back to Detroit and went through the normal charter flying and things like that before delving into corporate flying. And my first full-time corporate job was flying a Conrad 9800 for Jimmy Hoffa. Jimmy Hoffa mm -hmm. of the Teamsters. That's right. Oh, wow. Did you <laughs> meet him in person? You flew him himself? Yes, he was a, a short, stocky man, a workaholic, basically. He'd work 18 hours a day, or day in and day out. But he was trying to maintain control of a million-man union all by himself. And the bad part was there were people lurking in the wings that wanted to thrust a sword in this modern-day Caesar and take over. And eventually the government finally did that by giving him a prison sentence for bribery of the jury up in Chattanooga. It was a, a demise of a great guy, actually. It, since this was coming about, I often thought that uh, when he left, I'd probably have to look for a job too. So I found an ad in the Washington paper for pilots in Southeast Asia. So I applied and ended up getting hired for Air America and going overseas. Other than the location, did you know anything about Air America at that time? I knew a little bit about it. There was a fellow that come back and was telling tall tales at Detroit City Airport about flying in Southeast Asia for Air American Civil Air Transport. It sounded interesting. So uh, I applied and <laughs> wanted to file off on that. And I called his house and his mother answered the phone and I said, I'd like to talk to him. And she said, well, I'm sorry, but he committed suicide last week. Oh. <laughs> but I actually found out who it was 
that was backing this whole thing, but one of the union lawyers, when I gave notice that I was going to be leaving, he asked, who are you going to go work for? And I said, Air America. And he says, oh, yeah, that's the CIA. Oh, wow. And you had great visions of Terry and the Pirates, a comic strip at that time, and James Bondish type stuff, which was just emerging. The reality is far from the truth. It usually is, for sure. So it was kind of, a, would you call it like an open secret already by that time? That's right. They didn't tell the people they were hiring who the actual backing of was on this thing. Kept that from us, basically. I found out, of course, through my grapevine with the uh, union lawyers. Okay, okay, I see. Yeah, word seems to get around for sure. So what year was this, by the way, that you started flying with them? 1964, uh, with the agency, yeah. Okay, things are really heating up over there for sure by then. Yes, it was. Initially, I went to Tachikawa, Japan and flew uh, Southern Air Transport Pacific Division DC-6s. There it was sometimes just a milk run with troops and Stars and Stripes newspapers. But occasionally we'd get down to Okinawa and they'd pull the DC-6 over to the side of the field, strip off all the markings so there was no identifiers, bars and stars or anything on it, what nation it was it belonged to. And you'd come out at about two o'clock in the morning and leave all your identification, wallet and everything in operations, get in that thing is loaded with high explosives, crank it up, fly 10 hours down into Southeast Asia. You wouldn't talk to anyone during that entire period. Uh, you maintained radio silence and you flew about 500 feet off of normal airline altitudes. So you didn't have a mid-air and make a big bang. <laughs> land down there, offload, turn around, come back the same way. When you got about 15 miles out of Okinawa, you'd give them a call and they'd simply clear you to land. They'd pull it over to the other side of the field and put the bars and stars and end numbers back on it. Wow. What did it feel like the first time you did a run like that? Did it feel like what you'd been looking for or, or was it kind of yes. nerve wracking? No, that, that was kind of what I'm looking for. Flying in America back in prior to going there was not like it is today where you have radar coverage everywhere. With the Teamsters Union, oftentimes we'd, we'd do what they call scud run. If you could squeeze it, it uh, between the clouds and the ground and between there, you and your destination, you did that. And when we'd file a flight plan with the Teamsters Union, we'd file it to an airport where you really didn't want to go to. That was mainly because the FBI was following everything we were doing. And you try to pick an airport that didn't have a control tower, didn't have t anything around it. So you knew they had to send a poor FBI agent out there and park <laughs> and wait and uh, never any contact. And then we'd either change destination about 10 minutes before we we're so supposed to let down and go to where we really wanted to go. Wow. So long before you even made it to Southeast Asia, you were already kind of operating in that gray zone there. That's right. Okay, so that's that, right. I can see how that would draw you in and keep you there for so long in Laos then. <laughs> that's right. Well, actually, all corporate aviation back in those days went that way, particularly in Detroit and the automotive companies. Ford didn't want to let anybody else know who they were talking to as far as a supplier for seat cushions or rear view mirrors or the rest of that. And GM didn't either. So they often did the same thing. And they never discussed where they had been. That was a big no-no with the Teamsters and also in corporate aviation, because that would alert your com competitors on who you're dealing with. Sure, sure, makes sense. Industrial espionage is, is very, very real. Exactly. Wow, so you flew out of Japan. How long were you there before you moved to Laos? I was only there for about four months. Then I got my Chinese airline transport rating went down uh, to uh, Saigon initially. But uh, most of our airplanes were not American registry. I had an American airline transport rating, but the Chinese rating allowed me to fly all the airplanes that we had down in Laos and Vietnam. Many of those were also Chinese registry. So if it was found crashed and burning somewhere, they had plausible deniability. Hmm. 
That, yeah, that makes a lot of sense for sure. <laughs> so you're in Saigon. What was Saigon like in 19, I guess this is 64, early 65? That's right. It was crowded, chaotic. Initially, when I got there, we had 10 airplanes and 10 pilots. So I was off on the line in about three or four days as a captain. 30 days after that, they made me an instructor pilot. And by October that year, they made me assistant manager flying for the country. So I had uh, numerous programs that I was supervising and checking the pilots out in. Wow, you're, you're still very young then at that time, right? That's some rapid progression. Yes. Yeah, it was. I was in my mid-20s. Wow. Did you still get to fly as much as you wanted to? Sometimes, yes, I did. My biggest month uh, flying, it was in October of 1965. I flew 180 hours, which was an awful lot. And, <laughs> and of course, your, your living conditions were quite poor in Vietnam. We did not have the luxury of barracks and guarded quarters and the rest of that. We lived on the local economy. We rented from local people for lodging. It was not what uh, the military enjoyed. Hmm. Did you have any kind of cover for being there, anything like that? Or did you just tell people that you were Air America employees? That's right. Just Air America. And they kind of left us alone. They knew that we were kind of untouchables. Wow. Wow. Well, that's, that's good for you guys, for sure. Yes. And you were still flying the same stuff? You are flying high explosives and things of that nature already? Yes, and rice and, uh, and also programs that would be dreamt up in the uh, United States by someone that had a good lobby with the politicians. One big one was bulgur, which is wheat. And it's uh, great for hog feed. It makes good hog slop. And I actually, as a child, I'd eaten it because we'd uh, rinse the chaff out of it and we'd make porridge out of it. But the Vietnamese did not appreciate it. We'd fly in 12, 16,000 pounds of this to various strips, and the Vietnamese didn't like the taste of it. They were rice burners. They did not want this bulgur wheat. And they'd take and they'd dump it in the ditches way off the field. <laughs> wow, what a waste of time and money and effort and everything. Oh, yeah, it was. The other big waste was during Tet, during the big Tet uh, thing uh, that we had there in 1967, they had emergency wartime supplies flown into the Delta area of Vietnam. And the first one was 100 tons of real fresh chocolate milk in cans. You're kidding. No. Oh, boy. That was, that was another thing that was not popular with the Vietnamese because the milk gave them diarrhea. <laughs> I ended up with cases after case of that stuff at the house. <laughs> I can't believe that, of all things, was a priority during the Tet Offensive. Yeah, somebody checked the wrong box. Oh, okay. All right, that's much more believable for sure than it being a that's priority. Right. I can see that happening. <laughs> wow. So all of that time you're stationed in Vietnam? You're, you're living in Saigon at that yes. time? Yes, living in Saigon. Okay, and then when did you move on to Laos? Because that's where you spent most of your time with Air America. Is that right? No, uh, Vietnam and Laos pretty much equal. Oh, okay. I moved up to Laos in 1969, the latter part of 1969. I was assistant manager flying there in Saigon, so you had a seven-day-a-week, almost a 24-hour day job. You had a radio by your bed that they could call you out at any time. I wanted to get away from that and go back to just flying the line and having some time off to enjoy life and moved up there in 1969 and started flying C-123Bs. That was the one without the jets. And then in, during 1969, we started getting the jets on them. And that made a real bear out of it. I bet. I bet. That was the, the C-123. What was the name of that one? I don't recall right now. I'm thinking of the flying boxcar was the 119, wasn't it? That's right. It, this was called a provider. Provider. Okay. Okay, I've got you. You must have qualified on so many different airframes in your life. Yes, I've flown 130 different single-engine airplanes and 25 different multi-engine airplanes. Wow. And wow. So an airline transport rating in America, China, Vietnam, Cambodia, and a senior commercial in New Zealand. Wow. That's really something else. And you flew helicopters, you said, right, for the Air Force? Just a passenger and mechanic. Ah, okay. Okay, I see. I see. 
Wow, 155 total airframes. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. So I've heard that CAT and or Civil Air Transport and Air America have been described as the most shot at airlines in the world. Is that That's what it felt correct. like to you? Yes, it did. <laughs> in Vietnam, we didn't have many losses due to ground fire. One tragic one was a good friend of mine got shot down in the Delta. They put it down in a rice paddy. And before we get choppers in there, the bad guys got in and cut his throat. And it was a mess. Oh, wow. Wow. So you, he was recovered? The body was, yes. My gosh. Yeah, that's, that's hard to imagine for sure, especially not being able to reach them in time. That's right. It was a heartbreaker. Usually in the first hour, if you can get them, get somebody in there. And I had people in there in about 35 minutes, but the bad guys had already gotten in. Hmm. Was he flying a mission? I mean, had you flown that same flight path and those same missions yourself? Yes. In fact, I was supposed to go with him that morning. I like to go out and play with an airplane every now and then. And this guy was a pretty good friend of mine. And We'd do that, uh, go out and fly together and uh, just play with the airplane. Hmm. Boy, it's, it's amazing the turn of fate there when just for that, not being on that one flight changes everything, doesn't it? Yes, it does. But if I would have been on there, maybe I would have been able to put it down on a strip. Uh, he had a Chinese co-pilot and I don't think Johnny, uh, he didn't know what to do after they got shot up. Bill was wounded and they shot out an engine and I don't think he knew how to fly it. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I'm sure that's something that you've wondered about quite a bit is if you could have made a difference. 90% of the time we had Asian co-pilots. Okay. I see. They were, was it primarily Chinese or did you have Laotian, Vietnamese co-pilots as well? Chinese primarily. Uh, then we did have some Vietnamese, mainly in the uh, back of the airplane as load masters, or as we commonly called them, kickers, because they'd kick the cargo out the side of the door when we're airdropping. I've heard that, you know, I've read recently, and I want to know if you had any experience with or met any of these guys, the uh, smoke jumpers who were hired from the Forest Service? Yes, I know them all well. Oh, wow. Okay. I don't know a whole lot about their story. That's actually something I really want to get into later on as well. But I I've heard those guys went all over the place, much like you did, and, and were involved in some of the most dangerous missions all over Asia during that period. Well, yes, we had primarily Vietnamese and Thai load masters, but we had a, a core of Americans there too. Gene Hassenfuss was one and Lee Gossett was another load master we had. And he went back to the States and got his pilot's license and ended up as a pilot for Continental Air Services. Hmm. Continental. So you mentioned the crash on the plane that you were almost on. Did you yourself ever crash while you were flying overseas? Got shot down in Laos, in Southern Laos, in the plane to Bolivans with a C-123. Wow, wow, what was that like? Uh, that was a bad day at Black Rock. <laughs> <laughs> I'm certain. Uh, in Laos, there was, this country was controlled by about 100 CIA case officers, and they all had code names. You take the directions of where you're gonna go drop munitions and things like that from them. But you'd always better take it with a grain of salt because they were tasked with maintaining security in the particular areas they were assigned to. So if there were really a lot of bad guys there shooting, they would not tell you about that. Really? And, uh, you'd have to take that. Actually, if you looked at your load that you were going to drop, you had a pretty good idea how hot it was going to be. If it was artillery rounds and things like that, hey, they're booking those things out and keeping the enemy a long ways away from the site. So you could come in and make a normal drop pattern. But if you're dropping small arms ammo, Claymore mines and hand grenades, you know the bad guys are right on the wire. Wow. So you better keep it in tight and watch out. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That seems terribly counterproductive that they wouldn't be clear with you about what was happening. Is that because as a civilian, you could refuse to fly the mission or was it just because they wanted to keep that information close hold? You could refuse, I never did. I always used uh, a little cunning when I was involved with that. If it was a hot drop zone, so many guys would go up and circle down over it. Well, I always figured that was a bad thing to do because that just gives the little guys on the ground plenty of time to, to shoot at you. If you come in low and fast, drop and get the hell out of Dodge, you got a better chance of not picking up any holes. 
And that's the main thing I did use. If you're coming in a treetop level, it's pretty hard unless you're an excellent skeet shooter to lead the airplane enough to get around into it. And if they do, the rounds are going to hit in the back of the airplane. Hey, I live up front in the cockpit. The poor loadmaster's in the back. That's where the holes came from. Oh, boy. Wow. Well, that, that's very smart, though, what you're saying, without giving them time to you know circle in and, and giving them more time to get ready for you. That's right. I'm sure that saved some lives. Yes. Well, it, damn near got me that day, but I got my whole crew out, and we all bailed out. And I watched it impact and explode. But I had the only full crew come out back without any injuries other than abrasions from the parachute harness. Wow. So the, the helicopters were dispatched and they picked you up before the enemy got there then? Well, the first chopper picked me up and he had wounded on board from the site I'd been dropping at. He stuck his tail rotor into the trees and damaged it. So we went down on an old Japanese airstrip from World War II. We waited for another chopper to come in. And he finally did come in and picked us up. And as he got to the edge of the plateau de Lowlands, which is a large mesa, he ran out of gas. Oh. And we were auto-rotating down into a village. We didn't know it was good guys or bad guys. But as we rounded out down there, one of our turbine-powered H-34s came alongside and he had gun mounts on it. And that gave me the ride to the west way back. Those were all Air America choppers. Wow, wow, wow. That must have been incredible. The, so the, the tail rotor hits the trees, and you know you're not flying out then, just when you thought you're rescued. And then the second flight is auto-rotating in, and now you think maybe you won't be rescued after all? I can't imagine all the, the roller coaster of emotions you must have been feeling then. When you get that much adrenaline in your system, you just can't drink enough. <laughs> oh, hard to imagine. So you mentioned earlier that Laos was run by about 100 different case officers. Did you get to right, know any of those right. guys very well? Shep Johnson, yes, and Gray Fox, I knew him, and Church Bell. Tall Man is the one that uh, stuck me in a bad area. When I got back to Pak Se, where we'd flown out of, I still had an Uzi in my hand. When I walked into the office, he saw it <laughs> in my hand. He turned extremely white. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. I bet. Yeah, initially, if, if I wouldn't have had any problems getting out of there the first chopper, I might have killed him. But I'd cooled down enough. Oh, boy. That's good. Good for him anyway. <laughs> That's right. So you were armed every time you flew. Is that correct? Yes. Everybody carried. Well, the company issued us Uzis, which is a fine weapon. And you could carry 100 rounds of 9 millimeter with that thing. And it's very compact. And it's an excellent weapon. Prior to that, Everybody had a mishmash of stuff from Swedish K's uh, on down and handguns and the rest of that. And I always had a 38 caliber <laughs> Derringer in my shin pocket. Oh, wow. Last resort, I guess. <laughs> yes. Well, I could stuff it up somebody's nose and pull the trigger. <laughs> yep. Did you ever have to, did you ever have to fire a, one of your personal weapons at all? No, never did. But it was reassuring having it there. I'll believe it. I believe it. One question, you mentioned these guys all went by code names. So uh, Gray Fox and Tall Man, for example. I've heard a lot about Tony Poe in yes. Laos. Did, did you interact with him at all? Was he one of those that you one of the, that you mentioned? He had left Laos due to a disagreement with uh, General Vang Pao and went down into uh, Thailand and was managing training camps. He was training young Thais to come up there against the North Vietnamese regulars. Some of these kids were just not as tall as their M2. And that, that was pathetic. And to me, there was some training procedures that I thought were uncalled for, particularly with children. To take a live grenade and have them sit in a circle, pull a pin on the grenade, and pass it from hand to hand. As long as you keep the spoon down with your hand, but eventually some poor kid is going to be all sweaty and it's going to let, let go. Well, outside in a clear area, there's time for them to scramble away before the thing goes off. But I picked up one group of them that had been doing that up at 20 alternate in Laos, in the middle of Laos. They, they were in bad shape. I lost three of them on the way back. They died en route. Those things, to present it as a, a children's game is, to me, uncalled for. Wow. And these were Tony's trainees, and this was part of his training curriculum? Yes. Wow. 
I've heard a lot of stories about him, but that was that's a new one to me for sure. Oh, really? Yeah, it, Tony uh, was revered by some people, but some people, uh, for me, I, I wasn't really crazy about some of that stuff. Uh, the collecting of ears and things was kind of gross, I thought. And finally, the, the thing that stopped it was he brought a bucket of ears rotting in a bucket that he had not been paid for by the embassy and brought it in and dumped it on a secretary's desk. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I can't imagine that scene. Yeah, well, he was paying the people that brought these years in, I think, uh, 100 kip and 20 cents uh, for bringing in so-called enemies' ears. But then some of the villagers' children were missing ears. So it was not a, a good, good incentive. My gosh, all for 20 cents each. My gosh. Yeah. I can see why you'd want to put a stop to that, why anybody would want to put a stop to that, for sure. That's right. And they did. And that's when he left Laos and went down to the training camps. Okay. Okay. But he still got up to some, huh, I don't even know what to call them. He got up to some antics, I guess, down there, yes. it sounds like. Well, he, he was initially trained as a second lieutenant Marine, fighting the Japanese and also in doing interrogations. And... It was pretty brutal, and the Japanese were brutal also during World War II. So he was doing what he'd seen and done before. Yeah, that makes sense. I can I can see how it would impact someone for the rest of their life, especially. And I know mm -hmm. that he he went all over. I think he was in Tibet before that, yes. right? Working with the Dalai Lama as a yes. child and a few other places. I, I, I need to right. look into his story more, but there's a lot of twists and turns there for sure. It certainly is. In fact, our operation in the Congo it didn't last very long. They sent Dearborn and Coney down there flying T-28s, supporting uh, good guys, I guess. Hmm. Was that something <laughs> yeah, that you were a part of? Guys. No, I didn't go there. Uh, okay. Later on, I went to Nigeria just to do some road contracting for a company. It's not a place I wanted to be. Okay. So what finally got you out of Southeast Asia, well, out of Laos? Well, not much of anything, really. When Air America left in 1973, I did not want to go. I did a brief stint as a monk in a Buddhist Wat before I left Laos. And then I went down to New Zealand and flew down there for a while. A friend of mine called me up and said, how'd you like to come up to Cambodia? I said, sure. <laughs> and I did. And Cambodia was a nightmare on wheels. The trucking companies in Cambodia used to resupply the villages and everything else by trucks on roads. Well, the Khmer Rouge cut all the roads and kind of put the death knell on their businesses. So they decided, let's use airplanes. Well, they didn't want to spend a lot on airplanes. They, they thought maybe they could buy them for the same price as uh, an old truck. Well, they did buy some that way, and they were junk. Mm, uh, I can imagine. Yeah. I went there initially with an old Garuda Convair 440. Flew that there for, oh gosh, a couple of weeks and lost an engine coming out of a, a place called Batambang over by the Thai border. And it uh, was parked there. Bummed a ride back to Nam Pen and started flying a C-46, an old World War II vintage, pre, actually pre-World War II vintage airplane, large bird called Dumbo, affectionately by many of the people that watched that movie. But you could uh, carry a lot of cargo in it. But it was an old registered C-46. It still had the electric propellers on it. They're illegal in America. Ended up getting shot up in a site north of Phnom Penh, and parked it down on the coast in Kampong Sam on the coast. I was walking around it and checked the bullet hole and it just missed the fuel selector valve on the right side, which would have made us a torch. And walked up and uh, like most pilots, you, you grab the propeller blade and the damn thing moved back and forth. The whole blade was loose in the hub and about ready to come off. I had an awful vibration on takeoff. And that's what it was. Parked that and ended up with another Convair, Anchor Wat Airlines, a nice Convair. And it was Lao registered and uh, flew that until Fat Lady sang, left Cambodia. That was kind of traumatic. 
Wow. What, when was this exactly? That was on the 17th of April. Of which year? 1974. 74. Wow. You were, you were there for over 10 years then. Oh, no, 75. Oh, yeah, I spent 11 years there uh, eventually. 11 years in Southeast Asia. Right. Wow. So if I can ask, if you, if you look back now, which I'm sure you've done, how do you feel overall about Air America's role in everything that happened during that period? Were you, I'm sure that you're proud of the work that you did. Do you feel like you were going towards the common good? Were you, was it for the betterment of the area, for the security? Or do you feel like it was just a, a conflict that maybe was never ending? It was a conflict that had been actually going on for about 900 years, if you go back historically in that era. But I enjoyed Laos and the people we were supporting, which were the Hmong, the hill tribes of, Hmong, of the Laos. And they were extremely loyal. They were fighting for their homeland. That was kind of a sad thing to see them lose their homeland and uh, have to flee and go out of the country, basically. General Fang Bao, uh, who was the leader of the Hmong forces there, uh, had been trained by the French, and he was put in charge of the central highlands, and that's where the Hmong really lived, was up in the central high area in the mountains. They were so loyal, it was just heartbreaking to uh, have to leave. I can imagine, I've heard some wonderful things about them, and I know there's some some thriving communities here in America, but so many had to leave their homeland at the end of the war, and they did not receive the kind of support that they deserved from the United States after the fact, as far as I can tell. No, they, they didn't get completely shunned, but they had a hard go of it. Coming to America was extremely difficult. I've got a very good Hmong friend, Vu Yang, down here in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. I met him when I was doing some speaking at the Children's Library Project in Vietnam, in Milwaukee. He was a master of ceremonies, and he came up to me and he says, you know, Captain, you saved my family. And they took it upon themselves down on the shores of Lake Michigan in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, to build a memorial and put the names of those of us that died in Laos with Air America Continental Special Forces on their memorial. And it's about the only public one that's available. Hmm. So the, the memorial to Air America here in the America was actually funded and built by the Hmong. That's right. The public one that's on the shores of Lake Michigan in black marble is beautiful. And I think I may have sent you a picture, or maybe Luann sent you a picture of it. I have seen one. I have seen one. Yes, I think it came from you. They did not receive any support from the government or anything else. They, they went out and got the funding and they built it and got the land, which was, uh, I thought, a, a tremendous tribute and honor. I, I agree. And I, I think that makes it all the more meaningful as well that they did it on their own. That's right. That's wonderful. So are that is that the only memorial right now to Air America is just the one that you mentioned? There was one down in Texas and there's one in Langley in the CIA headquarters, but not everybody can walk into that place and see it. And it has all of them. Now, the one in uh, Sheboygan only has those of us that died in Laos. <laughs> That's powerful stuff. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that myself one day for sure. Good. Love to take you over there. <laughs> I appreciate it. There's one question I've been meaning to ask you. I have heard a lot, and this is kind of fast forwarding a little bit. I There's a lot of rumors that have gone around that I've read up quite a mm -hmm. bit about POWs who remain behind in Laos well after the conflict ended. Do you have any thoughts or opinions about that at all? Yes, I do. And the 18-year-old Marine that got, was found in Hanoi that had forgotten even how to speak English came out and back to the United States. And then, for some strange reason, they wanted a court-martial for uh, desertion. That scared a lot of the ones that were over there. And the ones that had assimilated into the Oriental society, had wives, children, and the rest of that, they didn't want to raise their hand and say, hey, here I am. It scared the hell out of them. And I'm sure there was quite a few there. Particularly in Laos, I think there was probably about three or four that had assimilated. Are these guys that deserted or, or that were captured, do you think? 
were captured and then they spent so much time in captivity that they became more or less trustees, much like our prison system. They were uh, released to go live their life and uh, they didn't really have any reason to leave because of the fear of coming back here and then going to prison. Okay, that makes sense. Wow. I can I can see how they would think that, especially after after years of captivity and, and no contact right. with the American government or anything. And also the publicity of that poor kid that did come out and got slammed. What year was that? I There was a guy not that long ago who turned himself in within the past 10 years, I think. Am I thinking of the right person or are you talking about somebody? I think so. This was a kid. He was an ex-Marine and actually a French journalist found him in Hanoi. He was more or less a trustee and they let him go into town and work and do things like that. And he could only speak Vietnamese. And he, he walked up to a French journalist and the French journalist questioned him and found out he was an American. They thought it per perhaps he was a Frenchman, but he wasn't. And uh, then it hit the, the news and uh, the U.S. stepped in and uh, brought him back. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. I'm going to have to look into that for sure. I can't think of his name. It was oh, quite a few years ago, back in the 70s, 80s. Okay. I'll have to look. Yeah. I, it's, I'm not recalling it at the moment, either his name anyway, but there were, you know, there were a lot of, there were films that were being made about POWs left behind. There were some missions by guys like Bo Greitz and a few yep. others. Yep. And there was a lot of smoke, but not a lot of fire as far as anybody ever found. But as a guy that spent as much time as you did in Laos, I was wondering if you, if you think that there's anybody that was still there against their will. I, I, I doubt it now because most of us are pretty long in the tooth and I doubt if they would have survived. I'm 84 and I'm one of the younger guys. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> well, what about like through the 80s? I mean, do you think that there were people still there in 1985, for example, or was that was that over with by then? If, if they were there, they were there of their own volition. Okay. That would be the only thing there. That makes sense. I know a few guys, I know of at least one guy I can think of right now who went back over just, he, he separated from the military and went back to live there and just, you know, he got married and he liked the culture and the, the life over there. Right. So he just moved back. That's right. And there's several people living in Thailand that way too. Mm -hmm. They went back. Okay. So you, you mentioned that you worked in Nigeria later on. What else did you do after you left Southeast Asia? After I left Southeast Asia, came back to the United States, which was a traumatic thing. I only had enough money to buy a space available ticket as far as Anchorage, Alaska, and got off in Anchorage, Alaska. And some of the other guys had gotten there because the bush flying was there and they needed pilots. And I flew up there in C-46s and Lockheed Electras in uh, Alaska. But Alaska, uh, it's kind of an iffy operation. Yeah, your maintenance is practically non-existent in most cases because you can't get a mechanic to go out on a ramp and work on an airplane when it's 35 or 40 below zero and the wind's blowing like hell. <laughs> He's oh, I'll bet. Uh, and I can't blame him. And there's a term called pencil whipping. Pencil whipping is when you see as the mechanic sees a squawk in the logbook and signs it off, but didn't do anything. Oh, boy. And uh, that, that does happen. It, it really does. I took off out of Anchorage one day on a C-46, and in the logbook it said, uh, uh, do not turn the cabin heater or the cockpit heater on until you've got 105 knots airspeed because the blower for it is broken. It says to turn it on, turn on the emergency fuel switch, and it will light up for you. Well, I got off the ground, the gears coming up and got the, the speed and uh, flipped that switch to emergency fuel. <laughs> and the tower promptly called me and says, you're trailing flame. <laughs> oh my gosh. So I turned it around and brought it back in. And they offered me a bottle of whiskey if I'd fly it without a heater. And oh, hell no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> sure, sure. I can, it's hard to imagine, honestly. <laughs> And got tired of Alaska and drove down to Florida, started flying charters and things like that down there. Saw an ad in the newspaper for pilots in South America. Well, I applied for that and I got it. And it was take a C-46 from Miami down to Guyana, South America. 
in Georgetown, yeah, Guyana, because they'd already leased one to the Guyana government down there, but it crashed and burned. Well, I flew that one down there, and as I'm on final, I'm seeing the tail of this other C-46 sticking out of the jungle, and it's got the same end numbers on it as I have on this one. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's not a good omen, for sure. I'm not a suspicious person, but... Or a superstitious yeah, yeah. person, but that's that's not a good omen. No, it's not a good omen. And that was in the period prior to Jones, Jonestown. They were moving people and equipment in there and building up that huge religious facility. And we flew a lot of stuff into the uh, site there, lumber and stuff like that. Never did meet Jim Jones, but the, the government thought he was going to be better than <laughs> a fresh gum. <laughs> that sure turned out to be wrong. No question, no question. That took a lot of people by surprise. Right. And also, we'd fly meat into Georgetown. We'd fly into the site called Lethbridge, which is right on a tributary to the Amazon River. And that was an area that was full of cattle back in the day. In fact, even John Chisholm came down and did a cattle drive from there over to the coast of Georgetown with cattle out of that area and it, it, his artifacts and stuff was in a little general store there and pictures and things. It was quite successful. They only lost 3,000 head in the rivers and to the alligators, but they thought it was a great thing. They never did it again though. And Chisholm went back to the States. Wow. But the slaughterhouse there was rather crude and fly in there early in the morning and pick up 16,000 pounds of fresh killed beef. And these sides would come up a, a, about a 12 inch wide plank on the backs of uh, the natives there and flop down on the floor of the C-46 and still leaking blood and blood would be running out of the tail wheel and we'd tie all of that raw beef down, covered in flies and all the rest of that. Fly that 16,000 pounds of that into Georgetown and it would get loaded into open steak bed trucks and more flies had joined the feast. And we'd go back and make a second trip. The second trip was a little scarier because by this time, all the blood and guts that had been taken from these, these cattle during the slaughter are now out in a huge pile by the slaughterhouse. And the buzzards are having a feast and the air is dense with buzzards. I only hit one once. Oh, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's hazardous for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's not FAA authorized, I'm sure. It doesn't sound like you did a lot of FAA authorized <laughs> stuff in your career, in your flying career. That's correct. That's, <laughs> Every once in a while though, we would get a trip down to Manaus in the Amazon River and pick up tropical fish down there and in barrels and aerated and fly them up to Georgetown, and then they'd be loaded on a, a Pan Am DC-8 and flown from there to New York City for the tropical fish business. You've hauled about every kind of load there is to imagine. <laughs> yes, from dead bodies to munitions. Oh, boy. So you were just with that company for just a, a short period then? Yes, until they stopped sending paychecks. Bummed a ride in a Cuban bird up to Miami. And then I went to work for a construction company, flying two of their airplanes that were, they were building I-75 down through the spine of Florida. That was a fun deal. The only thing was you got to see the underbelly of the contracting business and how the contracts are let, which is not really a, a legal or nice operation. There's much larceny involved. I can imagine, I can imagine. Yeah, construction is kind of notorious for that. These mm -hmm. are government contracts, I guess, with the DOT and... Yeah, I-75, yes. A lot and, of money. And back, oh, yes. Back then, of course, you had certain building requirements for I-75. You couldn't put big boulders or rocks in the, the base of the thing for a uh, fill, unless you caught the road inspectors, the federal road inspectors in a yellow truck and gave them 20 bucks to go in and get McDonald's. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, money go, makes the world go around for sure. Yes, it does. Not the, the cleanest type of business in, uh, that I've ever seen. Sure. 
Sure. So what, what year is this now that you were working on I-75? That was 1970, 76, 77, 78, right in there. Now, what was next on the menu for you? Next on the menu there was a step into the wild side. I know it's something that Air America was accused of many times, was running drugs, and we never did. That was a province of the Corsicans up in uh, Southeast Asia, and they had a couple of twin beaches out at the airport in Vincent, and they would airdrop to uh, the freighters in the Gulf of Siam, and then you'd go straight from there to Marseille. Hmm. Okay, this was opium and heroin, I, I take it? That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I was. I meant to ask you about that. I've heard some stories about Vang Pao being involved in that himself, and I, I didn't know if that was something that you had ever seen. Yes, that's true. He was involved with it, but you couldn't grow rutabagas in the mountains of Laos and make a profit and be able to support a family. The poppies were the only thing that would provide the, the cash crop, and I've seen it. It was in the market in Benchen. You could go in there and get a brick of sticky opium for $13 a kilo. That same kilo in New York City, you know, you're talking about a half million. So the profit margin is there to create larceny. Yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy that you would grow anything else under those circumstances. That's right. right. And the poor little Hmong up in the, the mountains that comes into town with his kilo of opium, he's going to get $13 for the whole year. You know, I, I can't fault him. I really can't. Right. I really can't. Right. Understandable. Yeah. And I don't, it wasn't illegal to grow it or anything like that in no. Laos, right? Yeah. But it, surprisingly, it was not illegal and it was available anywhere in Laos, but you didn't see addicts stumbling around in the street. It was not done. The only thing that some of the people would use it for was for their elderly. If they became infirm and unable to enjoy life, they'd offer them a pearl of opium. And if they'd swallow that, they'd go out in a dream. Hmm. Wow, just of their own yeah, choosing then. That's right. And I, I don't see anything wrong with that. It should be available here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're an adult making a decision for yourself, right? understand that completely. So that was years ago. That was in Vincin. And now that's, you said you're right. working in South America. Mm -hmm. And didn't see much of it down there, actually. Georgetown in that area was not big on that. The government controlled everything, even the little cigarette vendors on the street and the rest of that, and noodle carts uh, was owned by the government. At that time, Lyndon Forbes Sampson Burnham was the prime minister there. He was educated in England, had some pretty good smarts. Now, his own personal airplane or government airplane was a Beechcraft King Air, and it was painted purple. Oh, wow. Distinctive? <laughs> yeah, distinctive. But the economy there was just so fragile and hard to uh, maintain as a, uh, a dictator. It, it just really uh, didn't have the, the wherewithal to, to do it. But coming back to the United States, the job with uh, the construction company eventually went into demise. What they did was you could get overruns in all of these contracts. If you were the low bidder and you got it and you couldn't do it, you'd apply for an overrun. So you'd get more money and more money and more money. It, it just snowballed. And then once you got enough, uh, got enough money and flew it down to the Cayman Islands and put it in an offshore account that they couldn't check on, then you declared bankruptcy. And hey, see ya. <laughs> wow. So these are U.S.-owned construction companies doing this? Yes. Yes. That brought that to an end. So then I did step into the wild side. Back then, of course, marijuana was a big thing. I did fly that into the United States. There again, junk airplanes again. Oh, wow. Really? So did that, did that feel like a big departure because of all the, the variety of cargoes that you had carried over the course of your time in Southeast Asia? I mean, you were always, there was always an adversary trying to stop you, right? Did it feel like a, like a big change? A little bit, yes. You had apprehension on that, and you can't really justify it truthfully. That uh, is, uh, it was wrong. I know that. But it did happen, and it was economic necessity. I was trying to get some people out of refugee camps out of Palau Badong in Malaysia after the Vietnam War, 
And I ended up bringing home uh, about 100 of them. But I had the funding by that to, to do that. How many of these of these runs did you make? I made about 30. Wow, 30. <laughs> yeah. So you're just flying this old beat up plane, you're picking up a, well, where were you picking up? Was this in Colombia or was it in Guyana or? Colombia and Jamaica. Jamaica, okay. And then you fly it into, I guess, South Florida? Once into South Florida, primarily the most into South Carolina and Georgia area. Oh, wow. okay, much farther north. Yes. And that was uh, an interesting operation because the one fellow had the police on his payroll. They provided protection. Hmm. That's helpful if you're going to run that kind of operation, I suppose. That's right. And of course, even during Prohibition, that stuff happened. Too. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's not an unusual thing. How were you approached for this job to begin with? From one of the guys that had been fired from Air America. And he called up and in the acronym of that time says, how would you like to make a trip south? Well, South meant you're going down to Columbia. And I said, sure. I thought I'd do one of those, get enough money for a nest egg and call it a day. But there again, the adrenaline factor and everything is addictive. It truly is. That was your drug of choice. That's right. That was my drug of choice. And uh, it always has been, only now that I'm getting old and decrepit, it's uh, kind of taken back seat to a good steak and a baked potato. <laughs> a little bit safer, I suppose. Yes, a little safer, maybe. Right, right, right. Yeah, that'll get you in the end too, I'm afraid. But That's right. How much, if you don't mind me asking, how much were you being paid for these runs? Anywhere from a quarter of a mil to 150000 Per run? Per run. Wow. Okay. Okay, I can see why you'd want to do that more often after the first one anyway, if it goes well. That's right. That's right. You get addicted to the, the big money and the fast cars and all the rest and this of is, that. And this is, I, what, 1980 or so? It's not, it's not a pretty picture. Uh, yes. 79, 80. Okay, 150,000 per flight in 1980 or so. Okay, I can see the appeal for sure. All in cash. Wow. So what did you, I mean, how did you deal with that amount of cash? I mean, it's hard to imagine walking into a bank with it repeatedly. No, you can't really. There's several ways of doing that. You can buy gold coins. Cougarans were the thing back in those days. Of course, the safe deposit box and uh, bring it back. But I'll tell you what, bringing the refugees out of Southeast Asia cost a pretty penny. Can imagine. Did you work with them directly or did you have to work with a facilitator? No, I worked with them directly. I went to Palau Badong. Oh, wow. Okay, good. And out to the Canada, the island there is a quarter of a mile size island with about 50,000 people on it. It was pathetic. My gosh, quarter mile, 50,000 people. That's right. Okay, I can see why you'd want to get them out of there then. And they've all done well and their children have done well. It's uh, it's kind of a good feeling about that one. I can imagine. That's that's something good came out of that for certain. Mm -hmm. I paid for it, but it's all right. So how, what did happen? How did the last run go? Well, the bad part about our system is whoever turns you in normally walks away with a slap on the wrist. And that's what happened. The kingpin turned me in. He ended up with 18 months sentence. And <laughs> I, I had to bite the bullet for a few years. Were you arrested at the at the landing strip or at the runway, or did they come no, home? No, they never uh, did catch me that way. Eventually came to the house and walked me away. Hmm. But that was an education, too. I met some interesting people in there. Also had time to reflect and uh, re-educate myself. That was a good thing, I think. Sure. How did, how did you come out differently than when you went in? I came out without any need to take the, the risks that I had before. I know I can do just about anything. And I've worked so many damn different jobs. And it was kind of fun getting back into the fold, doing various things. <laughs> At one time, worked for the South Carolina Wildlife Federation. Really? <laughs> yeah. Little did they know that it was a felon in their midst. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep that one to yourself, for sure. That's right. Prior to that, Aviation is, is not a guaranteed uh, seven day a week fixed pay uh, job. It's, it's your production is what fuels your paycheck. Uh, as a result, when the flying is off or uh, the rest of that, you, you do anything and everything. At one time in 1959, I worked three full-time jobs. 
I was a flight instructor and charter pilot out of Reno Municipal. I also was a disc jockey on Radio K1, the right one, 1450 on your radio dial, Reno, Nevada. Oh, wow. <laughs> I bet that takes you back. Yes, it does. And uh, that was a good experience, really. I've done skydiving. And of course, that paid off. When I did get shot down. There was no surprises for me. My co-pilot that ruined his underwear, he'd never jumped before. Damn near killed me because he was hard to get out of the airplane. But I got everybody out first, and then I exited stage door left. Mm -hmm. Do you still fly now? No, unless somebody pays me. <laughs> sure, sure. Flying has gotten so expensive now. It's just ridiculous. When I was a teenager, I could buy aviation fuel for 35 cents a gallon and fly all day for $5, you know, in the Cessna 140, no problem. But now, even uh, at Meg's Field down near Chicago, uh, fuel's $9 a gallon. Are you kidding me? You know, that, that's crazy. And insurance rates are just so high. Back then, as a, a young pilot, insurance through Evemco was $26 a year for a kid. <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah, times amazing. have changed. Times have changed a bit. Oh, yes, it certainly has. And you've got to have so many rules and regulations. The planes back when I started flying did not have transmitters in them. You only had a receiver in the airplane. And most of the time, you looked for lights from the tower. That was your air traffic control. <laughs> I bet modern pilots can't even begin to imagine what that was like. No, they can't, but they envy you. Yeah, yeah. That took a lot of skill, I'll bet. It did, and it, and it really did good things for you. You learned an awful lot of the good basics that would serve you for the rest of your life. One thing that they do today, even, they take off and they bring the power back right away, supposedly saving gasoline. Well, that's a fatal way of doing it because most engine failures happen at power change. So if you get off the ground and you pull the power back immediately after the gear hits the well and it quits, don't be surprised. And you better have an idea of where you're going to put the damn thing. Oh, sure. Sure. <laughs> and so many of them do that and they, they die. Mm -hmm. hmm. it's, yeah, that's really, that's really something else. It's hard to imagine. It is. So tell me, I know that you just recently wrote a book and you've certainly got an incredible story to tell. Can you tell me a little bit about the book? Yes, the book is called Flight. And it be, was born in four oh, years ago. I hand wrote it and typed it out. And had about 400 pages of a manuscript and did not have the money to uh, self-publish the thing. And I'd been speaking over here at Air Venture. And during one of the Air Venture presentations, a lady by the name of Luan Grosskup was in the audience. And at the uh, end of the presentation, she says, let me buy you a beer. I'd like to talk to you. And I said, okay, I'm open for that. She says, you really need to write this stuff down. And I said, well, I have. And I got about 400 pages of it. Would you like to see it? And she kind of got a funny look. And I think she's had a lot of manuscripts that were better as toilet paper than <laughs> something to read. And she said, sure. Well, I sent it to her. And uh, about two days later, she called and says, we've got to get an agent. And it, it went upward and onward from that point. She was a published author and uh, she cleaned up some of my iffy passages. I was not too kind about my extracurricular activities in Laos. Okay, but, understandable. Uh, you need a second uh, set of eyes on it sometimes, I can imagine. That's right. And she found a, an agent and the agent, uh, of course, found a publisher right away. And we had a big book launch here in Oshkosh. That's great. I know and, uh, a lot of people are going to be very interested in reading that, especially after they hear you here. Yeah, it's on Amazon. It's called Flight by Hansen. Flight by and, Neil Hansen. Uh, right. They'll see a cover of the thing and the rest of that. And we'll be bringing that out on a nice speaking tours here this year again. And uh, next year, they've got me as the keynote speaker for the Vietnam Museum and Memorial down in Waterford, Texas on Memorial Day. Uh, the COVID thing, I guess, is kind of over down there. Yes. Yeah, that seems that way. I'll have to bring a six. Well, good. I'm sure you're looking forward to that. <laughs> Anything else I can do for you? Oh, well, you and I, we connected through the Air America Historical Society, which you're very active with now. Is that right? Right. Right. I'm the president of that thing. 
Yeah, I've seen some just browsing through there on my own time. I found some incredible stories, some incredible photos there. So I'm really glad that we were able to connect through that as well. Does that keep you busy as well? Actually, Luan does most of the work on that thing. And yes, I do jump in there and put a comment down a time or two and do a, a little video insert. Good, good. And try, trying to keep it alive. We got to keep the memories alive or all the people have died for nothing. Absolutely right. And there, there's some incredible stories there. I'm really just in awe of everything I've learned. The more I read into it, the more I want to read into it. Good. Good. There's a lot of stories about the Hmong and uh, they, they were great fighters. They really were. Absolutely. I've heard a lot of great, I've never heard a bad thing about them, as a matter of fact, only positive from everybody who's ever worked with them. Yeah, Vang Pao had me at their national reunion up here in Springfield, uh, Wisconsin. That was, gosh, 90? Then, of course, John Eskow got me to input some stuff for the script of the movie. But it's a movie. It's a Hollywood production. And they have to make money because uh, they're paying Robert Downey Jr. and Mel Gibson $8 million. And they can't do a documentary and get money out of that, which I understand that totally. But they use some of the stuff I have in the book, too. And John's a real good guy. Good. If they watch the movie now, what should they look for that's accurate in the film? Accurate is some of the airdrops are really good and the thing. Now, the, the only thing that was not real about that whole thing was switching from helicopters to fixed wing to single engine and the rest of that. No, we didn't do that. When you went into a program, you stayed in that program until you transferred or something else. But there they got to fly everything, which they had to do that for the movie. I understand that totally. But they used my coloring book routine and a couple of other things in there. Oh, the coloring book routine? Okay. Okay, good. That came from yeah. you. Yeah, that did. Great, great. Well, Neil, this has been really informative. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me about all this today. Good. So I'm going to look for the book on Amazon. I'm going to direct everybody who's listening as well. Is there anywhere else they can find you? The, the Historical Society Facebook page, I guess? Yes, yes uh, Air America Historical Social Club. There are no dues. We're just trying to keep the past alive. Okay, great. Hopefully you get a few more followers and a few more interested audience good. members as well. Good. And then if they want to, they can get me as a speaker. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. I mean, you're a great speaker, honestly. So I'm sure that'll be really interesting. Good. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Neil. I really appreciate it. You take care. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Justin. Okay. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram at Spycraft 101 or connect with me on Patreon. My patrons get exclusive access to long form blog posts that dive deep into some of the most amazing stories in the history of espionage and receive free or discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. Thank you for listening and I hope you'll stick around because there is always lots more to come. Thanks for listening to this program brought to you by Daydreamer Network. If you enjoyed the episode, please don't forget to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or your preferred platform. Your feedback allows us to rank on the best new shows list and continue to grow our podcasts in order to bring more unique and talented storytellers to the network. To check out our shows, including programs about relationships, sports, business, nutrition, leisure, and more, head to www.daydreamernetwork.com. We look forward to seeing you back next week for another great episode. Have a wonderful day.